Hi folks, Jack Spirico here and uh, we're ready to start with you the next video in the uh, permaculture series. Today we're going to talk about polyculture, but remember the last video I did was on the seven layers of the forest system and I'm hoping that you guys will see the parallels between what I'm going to show you and talk about today uh, versus seeing them as two different things. Because one thing you start to realize as you really get into the science of the design of permaculture is that there's absolutely no piece of it that's not connected to every other single piece. And you'll actually see the patterns of design across all the principles, across all of the guilds. If you don't know what a guild is, don't worry, I'll explain that to you today. Uh, you'll see it everywhere. And you'll start to realize that the thing that applies to the forest applies to a little pot of, of plants on a, a tabletop even. You can recreate the system of layers or some of the layers and, and see that almost you can develop little worlds, so to speak. Let's, let's develop one now. But let's start out with a statement. This is a Spearco statement. This is not somebody else that I'm referring to. I don't know if anybody's ever said this other than me, and maybe a lot of people have. But this is the way I look at it. Polyculture. It's all about space and resource utilization. People love to talk about polyculture, especially in permaculture, because it's, well, it's better than monoculture, and plants can share things. But usually you only get half the, of the, the equation. I'm going to try to give you the whole thing today. So let's start out with understanding this, and let's pretend that we have, I think I took my brown marker home and put it in my pocket, so we'll use black for the earth. So there we go, we got a little piece of land. And on this land, we plant tomato plants, okay? And again, I don't even try to draw good, I just tell you what it is and you have to use your imagination. So we've got tomato plants. And we even have some, uh, we have some tomatoes on them because they actually are productive tomato plants. We don't have a lot of problems with them. I'm not saying that doing what we got here is wrong. In fact, in agriculture, there's a case for this because now I can go in and harvest all at one time and then take my product to market. I'll also have sticks, likely, holding my tomato plants up that I'll have to tie them to. And this is a typical monoculture. There's one plant species here, tomatoes. And when we look at this, we see a bigger problem than it's just that it's monoculture and it doesn't have other things to share. Each one of these plants has a root system, rather shallow but very heavy root system. And the primary nutrients that plants need are N, P, and K, right? Nitrogen, nitrogen phosphorus, and potassium, right? Now, this is what we got going on here. These guys need the exact same ratio of N, P, and K, and they all need to get it right here in their root zone. Even if we fertilize it with organic fertilizer, which is okay to do, we're still, it has to get into this root zone, and they're all competing for it, right? What else do they need? They need sunlight. Do you notice how they're all about the same height? They all need sun, and they're all getting the sun shouldn't make the sun black. That would be a bad day if we had a black sun. So the sun's up here. It's shining its little sun self off. And it's shining rays down onto our plants. And they're all competing for the same sun. They're also competing for the same space. So we have to space them out. We have spacing requirements. And those spacing requirements are you know, sufficient to allow for this to work. What if we want to plant more stuff in the same space? We can't just put the tomato plants closer together because then we exasperate the problem competing for the resources. So, again, it's our little world we're creating here today, so we can do anything we like with it. So we can just get rid of all those tomato plants. And um, I need a better tray for my whiteboard. And then we'll come in and we'll start out and we'll put our little tomato plant, little tomato vine, back into place. He's growing here. He's even got something to support him with. A cage or a stick. And he's got his tomatoes going on. Alright. I'm, I'm going to take a course in basic drawing so I can do a better job for you guys. But you got your tomato plant there. Now, one of the big things that tomatoes need is potassium. They're heavy potassium feeders. So what a lot of people would do, smart people, would maybe plant a comfrey plant right here because comfrey has lots of potassium and we can just break leaves off of here 
and just start mulching on a tomato, and that's one way to help it get some potassium. Okay? And, and comfrey leaves break down really quick and, and, and release it, but what people leave out is, well, why does the, the comfrey have lots of potassium? Well, it has lots of potassium because it has this long taproot that goes down into the ground. It looks like a carrot almost. Right? But what people don't realize is then it's got this little hair root, and that hair root, man, that thing might go way down. And it might literally be about as big as a hair. You wonder how it can find its way through the soil like that. So it goes way down there. And a lot of the potassium's down there. And this plant is very good at getting the potassium that the tomato can't reach. But it also doesn't need the, the potassium that the potato can, or the tomato can reach. It also doesn't need the same space. So now maybe we could come in here, and I keep saying this because some people seem to think corn's evil. I don't like GMO corn or nothing. But maybe I could even come in here and I could plant a couple, maybe five or ten corn plants. Plant one maybe over here, right? Okay. And maybe I come over here and I'll put in a great big mammoth sunflower. So I got a big sunflower here, right? So maybe I'll have another one of those over here. And they're putting all kinds of beautiful little leaves out that create shade. And when you garden in Texas or Arkansas or other hot places, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And then maybe what I'll do next just come in like we were talking about before with the Three Sisters Garden. This time I'm going to plant my bean plant and let my bean plant run around my sunflowers. So I've got my beans up there and I've got beans running up around my corn. And then I said, you know what? I, I like cantaloupe. Well, let me go squeeze a, a cantaloupe plant in right here. And it starts, it goes out like what from yesterday? Ground cover. And it starts crawling all over the place. And it, it doesn't need, doesn't have a problem just crawling around all this stuff. And you know, maybe it starts growing us some cantaloupes. So we got some cantaloupes, so they could be squash and pumpkins. Anything would do this. And I also say to myself, you know, self, tomatoes and basil taste really good together. So now I come in here and I plant myself a little basil plant. Right? And the basil plant may be right in between the comfrey and the tomato, right in there. And they do wonderful together. And then the basil has roots that are kind of like this. They're a little bit deep, but they're not much deeper than the tomato. Now that sunflower has this huge flat root system, big, big root system. Corn, shallow and not very wide. Yeah, we got our big flat, doesn't go real deep, but it is very wide, or else this huge plant would fall over. And our cantaloupe, even though it's going all over here, its roots are, let's say they're right here, and it's got this kind of flat root system. So now each one of these plants needs different ratios of the primary nutrients. It needs, uh, they need other things too, like calcium, for instance, but they're not competing in the same space. So it's not just that something like the comfrey is able to mine uh, the potassium from deep and bring it up. It's that it's able to get it from a different spot. And when I build something like this, and people would say, well, can I put, you can put anything you want. In fact, you shouldn't limit yourself at all. If you want some peppers, go ahead and throw your pepper plant in over here, right? Put some jalapenos on there, some red ones. I know it's a black pepper plant. I didn't realize that's the one I had. So we, we got our peppers over here. Shovel one in there. And you say, well, how, how, how densely can I plant if I do this? Well, we do have to respect the spatial requirements of the plant. But we also know that the tomato can be trained mostly up, or we can train it across the ground, but up is more traditional. So if there is some area around underneath of it, we can plant some things that will still get some light. That's OK. We know that the, the, the beans will climb with the sunflower, so we can plant those right on top of each other. We know that the 
uh, the cantaloupe only needs a relatively small area for access to the dirt and it can just crawl out and find light so we can pack it in there. But the real answer is we find out by doing it. We plant the crap out of it. We plant all kinds of things in there. And then we'll observe that, well, maybe we went a little bit overboard here with the basil and one of them's not doing so well. So we'll go in there and we'll just say, you know what, this basil plant, we're just going to take the whole thing and use it when we make some uh, bruschetta with our tomato tonight. And then what will happen is whatever else it was competing with will fill in the space, just like the forest. Do you see the layered system here? Maybe not quite as dominant, not quite as elegant, but you've got canopy, right, with your giant sunflowers. You've got subcanopy. We've got climbers. We've got a root yield. Wait a minute. Maybe, maybe they're all there. You say, well, they're all really herbaceous plants, but isn't it maybe the basil and the comfrey that are taking more of the herbal layer up, right? And then, well, look here. We've got a ground cover layer, right? So we've got all of the, we've got all of the layers of the forest in a, what looks like a really simple guild. We've got tomatoes, we've got peppers, we've got basil, we've got comfrey, we've got a little bit of corn. We're, in the corn, we're going to need to put in enough corn to make sure we get pollination. But if we put in a little little grouping of about you know six corn plants here and six corn plants here, we can do that. Now, think about this. You're a pest, an insect, and you are a tomato hornworm moth, and you like you want to lay your eggs so your little hornworms can eat tomatoes and potatoes and other things in the tobacco family. And you're flying along, and this is what you see. When you flew along and you saw the first thing, you're going to go there. This is a little confusing. I'm not quite sure if this is the right place. So as I come into this, and I, maybe I even find a tomato, but I'm a little confused and I have to think about what I'm doing and work my way around and find it, I'm a lot more likely to get predated on by a predator. So polyculture is absolutely awesome. It's what we should be doing, and, and, and this is a guild. So when I said earlier, a guild, when you put a grouping of plants together, that's a guild. And is this a winning guild? I don't know. I've never actually planted this particular guild before. Like I said, I was going to create a little world. I just did it. I, my gut is it would work well. Because all seven layers are there, because we have different root structures and different root needs and different nutrient needs and different provisions that other plants are making for each other. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Give it a shot, but think about it while you're doing it. Because we think of gardening as very, very simple. But when we do it with permaculture, it becomes very, very complex. That doesn't mean it's difficult. It means it's got a lot of complexity to it. This is a much more complex uh, ecosystem uh, than we, we have with tomatoes, even though it's all annuals. Even though at the end of the season a frost is going to come, it's all going to go away. But we can keep replanting it. Like when the corn's harvested and the beans are harvested, we can go in there and say, well, even our sunflowers, maybe our sunflowers are still living. But now it's getting later in the year. So now we go in and we start right in that space that was created and we put in some greens like you know, since it's going to be winter, arugula and, and, and lettuce and spinach as we're getting into the cooler part of the year. As the sunflowers die off, and we can plant it right into our fall and winter season going through like that. Um, it's, it's completely unlimited. It's completely up to you. But this is polyculture. Uh, tomorrow we'll come back with another video for you.